we can't afford to give him that for at least yeah. four years. But you could have chosen to afford to give it to him if you had chosen to downsize your lifestyle. This is about wants versus needs or needs versus wants. Okay, so the pity party of, well, we can't afford, we can't afford to give our child this. Yes, yes, you could have. Your child doesn't care whether or not you have a fancy kitchen to rate to, to, you know, make his meals in. Your child doesn't care about the size of your house. Your child j just cares that you're there. So sometimes the pity party of, well, we just can't afford to give Junior this. Well, yeah, that's because you're paying $3,400 a month on your mortgage. Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to the computer deck. Welcome, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. All right, so we're going to take a look at a new story. It's about five minutes that ran on CNN in January of this year. So that being 2024. And the title of the news story is called Struggling Millennial Homeowner. I didn't need my degree. And of course, they're referring to the college degree. Now, I saw this story earlier this year when it ran. But I decided, you know what, since it came across my feed again, all right, um, since this channel does deal with consumer debt and college debt, house debt is all part of your consumer debt. I thought, you know what, I think it would be worth taking another look at this and sharing my commentary thoughts with you. Now then, with that said, please understand that my commentary is strictly relating to the people in this news program. It is not referring to all young people, all millennials. I have a nephew in his mid twenties. Okay. Mid to late twenties. It's not referring to everybody across the board. So the commentary, the critiques, you know, what might sound like criticism, it's not meant to be applied to everyone of that age group. I am simply referring to what I see in the story. But what I want is I want to help kind of bridge a disconnect that um, young people have. In this case, we're talking about the millennial generation. OK, um, I want to help bridge that disconnect because I think a lot of the times, you know, millennials will say something like, um, you know, we can't make ends meet. But part of the problem that I see as a 56 year old, OK, looking at what younger people do is I believe young people, a lot of them, not all. It's never all. It's never nothing. And it's never always. OK, but I believe a lot of young people have unrealistic expectations of where they should be at, let's say in their you know late 20s and 30s or how much things are going to cost. And I want to kind of help bridge that gap. So I want to do this in a critical but friendly, okay, commentary style to just kind of go, you know what, here's what I see. Here's what the millennials are seeing. And perhaps this is why so many millennials are struggling. All right. So let's go ahead, take a look here. And again, this just applies to the people in this story. This is CNN struggling millennial homeowner. I did not need my degree. Let's go ahead and take a look at this story. Rich, we have $435 to last until the end of the month, okay? What? Actually, till February 4th. <laughs> That's even worse. I know. When we report on how great the economy is doing, what do you, do you feel that? I, I don't, I don't feel it. I don't doubt that it's gotten better, but nothing necessarily feels like it really got easier on us. I don't feel like I'm getting a break anywhere. The American economy looks strong, a robust job market, stocks near record highs, inflation cooling, but many people are not feeling the positive vibes. Now that I think with that, we can all agree. All right. And I think part of the problem is that a lot of people are like gig workers. Okay. And gig workers, I find, believe they're kind of the people who are uh, chasing a bunch of different types of jobs. They're not necessarily going for a career, but it's like a little here, a little there. All right. Um, a lot of the jobs reports, I believe. Okay. If, if I understand the jobs reports correctly. All right. Um, and I'm certainly no economist or, you know, heavy financial guru, guru person far from it. But I believe a lot of the problem is they're showing that people are employed and it's like, oh, great, you know, everybody's got a job, but what are the jobs? How much do these jobs pay? Is it in the um, industry that, that people are trained, you know, perhaps specially trained for? If you're having to hold two, three jobs, or let's just say even, you know, three jobs, okay, to try to make ends meet, can that be considered successful? 
I would say it's probably not considered successful if you're holding three jobs. And it's even questionable if you're holding two. And so I, I hear the reports as well as you guys do that talk about just how great, you know, the economy is going and you're like, really? Have you looked at the price of stuff lately? So I don't think the economy is as good as what the news is saying to be personally, you know, just to give you my personal thought on that. I see $400 going towards my student loans and I see 545 going for HOA and I see groceries uh, averaging about 150 a week. Sure, maybe for my wife's, uh, you know, retirement portfolio, it might be looking great, but we need to get there first, right? On Saturday, we heard how MetLife Stadium is preparing for the World Cup final. Danny Navarro did not plan to be a TikTok creator. If FIFA decided to sell tickets for the 2026 World That was not his goal when he graduated with a history degree on a scholarship from the University of Virginia and started working at a nonprofit. Okay, let's stop for a minute. As you know, um, if you've watched this channel, I'm an educator. He graduated with a history degree. Here is my question, and I would ask it a hundred times. What are you going to do with that history degree? And if you think of history degrees in terms of the current tech, uh, what is it, current technological advancement, if I want to know something about history, do I really need to even go to a history major to get that information? What can I do? Right. I can just sit down on the computer and Google it up. Matter of fact, I not only can Google it up, I can probably find a live cam somewhere in that area. OK, I, I found a live cam the other day on uh, pandas in China. OK, um, I can Google Earth it and practically put myself there. History. OK, um, those liberal arts degrees almost to me sounds like a hobby degree. Oh, I love history. Let's study it. But looking in today's market, who's going to hire you for it? If you're going to do history, you typically, I would recommend history with something. History with education. But keep in mind, in education, history, geography, I believe those, those areas are two of the most popular and as such most difficult areas to get a job in. Okay. But to just simply graduate with the history degree, young people. You have to ask yourself, what are you going to do with that degree? And he didn't ask himself that. Well, you know, it's a liberal arts degree. It's a hobby. You need to put, it's just my recommendation, put a liberal arts degree, history, English, French literature, whatever. Okay. You need to attach it to something like education where you're now qualified to teach French. You're qualified to teach history. Otherwise, just simply say, hey, I can major, I majored in, you know, history in and of itself. That that's that's great. But today I think it's looked at as more of a hobby. I was at the sixty thousand dollar mark of my salary, and the only way that I was going to crack 80, 90 potentially was to get a grad school degree. So did so you, he made the same uh, thing. He did the same thing that I did. I figured, hey, I could go get myself a master's degree and that would allow me to make more money. Okay, so I go and I get a graduate degree, which then moved my student loan from forty to $80,000 to get my second master's degree. It was a second master's degree. And then I realized I'm so far in debt, I can't even pay off the degrees. It's like we tell ourselves we can make more money if we'll go back to school and get into more debt, because in his case, he's talking about graduate school. But the problem is, yeah, you make more money, but what do you owe on the debt that you've now accrued? What is the difference? And could that difference have simply been solved by taking a little part time job at, you know, the at Rick's crib crab shack or something where you're not beholden to a student loan company? Danny went back to school for a master's degree in public administration. This time, he had to take out student loans. I had to take out $70,000 in loans, which is more than what I was making. And then right off the bat, having to pay that debt down. And so it's almost like we just were, we're, we're, we're basically thrown into the hole and right, right away, we have to start climbing out of it. Let's see here. That it was eight years ago, and the promise that his college degrees would lead to a steady paycheck has not paid off. No, uh, young people were told, and, and I'm going to to acknowledge this and say, you know, 
they're right. Young people are correct when they say, look, you know, we went to school, we went to college like everybody told us to. Everybody told us student loans is normal. Everybody told us, you know, don't worry, you'll get a job, just do what it takes to get through school. And even worse, a lot of people weren't, you know, they didn't know the difference between private school versus out of state school. So there's a problem there also. So what do they do? They go to their dream private school out of state, right? So they make a big problem even bigger. He was told, go to college, go, go do this. So you're first generation. And what was the dream for you? What was the dream if you went to college? We would escape poverty. And, you know, for, for, for immigrants that are coming to this country, that's always the, the thing that they tell you. Danny now juggles three jobs, soccer coach, tutor, and TikTok video creator. And did you need a degree for any of those? Remember, look at the title, struggling millennial homeowner. I don't need my degree. He's a soccer coach. He's TikTok and a tutor. You don't, you don't need no 70, $90,000 in degrees to do that. I don't have a full-time salary job since uh, November of 2022 and it's not without trying. I've tried to, I've, I've actually applied to about a hundred jobs. A hundred jobs. I've heard this a lot lately and you can hear it on the TikToks, you hear it on the news reports. People are applying now in today's you know, uh, May 2024, okay? People are applying to hundreds of jobs and they're not landing anything. Hundreds. And What's also scary is what some of these job requirements want for the lack of pay. They want someone with all these years of experience, oftentimes all these degrees, and then they want to pay you half of what you might have normally gone for a few years ago. I would say about uh, in the past year and, and change, and a couple of them have gone into the final round, but just unfortunately not been selected. You want to look outside? Come here. Look outside. My life is very different than what I envisioned it would be. Crazy. Rachel Gambino and Garrett Mazio followed the roadmap that previous generations said would spell success. Go to college, get married, work hard, buy a house, start a family. This is the American. Okay, so 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 they've got all three of it packed on. They've got the college, they've got the baby, they have the uh, house. I can dream, but it, at what cost? So we have all of those things and we appreciate every single one of those things, but we think about how we could lose those things very quickly. If one of us loses our job, um, we're, we're in a not good place. Between their college debt and monthly mortgage payment, they feel they've slipped into a lower economic class than the one they grew up in. Do you describe yourself as middle class? I like to think we are. I, I uh, would say lower middle class. Why? Hold on. Why? Because when I think of middle class, I think about people who are able to just get up and go and do things within their means and like not extravagant things, but be able to get up and go to dinner whenever they want or maybe take that trip, that long weekend trip. We don't have that. Okay, we're going to stop. I'm going to pause this uh, video here. Pausing it here at three minutes and 30 seconds. Got my handy dandy little thing in case I accidentally bump the uh, timer. I know where we're at. All right. This is the crux of what I really, really want to talk about on this video. She says that um, she sees herself as lower middle class, all right, um, because they can't do the things that they want to do. Now, you're going to see why I put a time stamp on this video. So we're at 3.33. I'm going to back this video up, all right? You're just going to have to bear with me here, folks. But there, there's a reason. Trust me. All right, there's, there's a reason. I just want to pause right here. Hold on here. See if I can find the exact spot. Just give me a second. All right, I want you to take a look at their surroundings. Okay, this is what I want you to see. Okay, so first off, this is, let's go right here to the front of their house. All right, um, that's a pretty darn nice house. This is nicer than the house my parents currently live in. All right, this house looks really nice. Uh, judging from the outside, you step inside the house. Now, remember, these are millennials who are struggling to uh, get out of debt. And I'm sitting here looking at the kitchen area. All right. Why don't you look at the cupboards? All right. I want you to look at the cupboards. Also, I want you to notice there's paneling. 
There, there's a reason this matters. Okay. She says that they are lower middle class because they can't do the things that they want. I want you to look at, to me, okay. And I, I know if you're really rich, this is not opulent to me. This is pretty darn nice living. This is not lower middle class in my opinion, by any means. All right. Um, let's take a look here. We're going to keep going through here. Okay. I'm looking at the sink, this sink, by the way, um, it'll come clearer, clearer later. This seems to be a farmhouse style sink, which is by no means your run of the mill sink. Now you may say, well, what does a sink have to do with it? It's not about a sink. It's about all the hidden luxuries that are built into this house. It's all when people sit and they go, where is my money going? It's all the hidden upgrades. This house is loaded from what I can tell. And from what I recall with upgrades. Okay. Um, it's something to consider when people talk about how broke they are. This is not a house of four walls. Um, what is it? Four walls, a roof and a floor. This house is from what I can tell, appears to have a lot of upgrades to it. Okay, we've got a wine rack in the back. I mean, this is nice. And she's saying that she sees herself as lower middle class because, quote, um, we can't afford to just do the things we want to do. You know, we can't afford to take that long weekend or I think she said have that meal. Well, here's something to consider. I grossed 70000 in 2023. I purchased a new car about two months ago. It'll be paid off in about six more payments. Okay. I'm paying it off in between six to eight payments. Um, I should be able to pay it off in about seven. Okay. Brand new Toyota Corolla, 26,000. All right. Um, I'll have it pay. I'll have it paid off uh, by November 1st. Now then I live on half of my income. All right. When, when, when the car is paid off, because before the car was paid off, I was living on half of my income. Uh, because I'm debt free. And then I decided to take on a car so I could stop leasing. And then I'll go back to living on half of my income. Now she says they are lower middle class because they can't just go out and eat when they want. They can't take a weekend vacation. And I'm looking at these surroundings that she's in. This is just a snapshot of her kitchen. This is the kitchen. All right. And I'm thinking this ain't no lower middle class. But here's something to think about, a straw to chew on. I make 62000 all right, is my base as a teacher, 70,000 with my little, you know, part-time childcare gig. Guess what? I can afford to take a weekend vacation if I want. Yes, I can, on a whim. I can afford to eat out nice if I want. I just choose not to do those things. But I live behind me in 840 square feet. So how is it, just something to think about, that she can say, oh, we're, we're lower middle class because we just can't afford to go out and eat and we can't afford to just go on that weekend vacation. But yet most people look at her place and go, well, she's richer than I am. But is she really? And if that's lower middle class and broke, because they're broke, all right, no disrespect, but you know, they are, they're very tight. But I'm not broke. I'm not tight. I can save 50% of my income. I can live off of one paycheck. So what does that make me? I'm either broke by their standards. I mean, I'm living in pure poverty then, if you're looking at me, or I'm actually upper middle class because I'm not in the financial position they're in. And somebody may say, well, yeah, but you don't have the house they do. But the point is, is they bought too much house. We judge, I think, oftentimes the class, we're judging it by the materialistic surroundings someone has versus judging someone's class, so to speak, by how financially stable are you? I'm, not, I'm just going to back that up for about two, we're about 333. All right, so let's, let's start on here. Things within their means and like not extravagant things. But okay, well, they're clearly not living within their means now, are they? If they're stuck and they're feeling like we can't buy anything, they bought too much house. This is too expensive. So on one hand, you know, she talks about, well, you know, we want to be able to do these things and we should be able to do these things and live within our means. We can't, you can do it. They need to downsize this house, way downsize this house. 
then they can live within their means. It's and, and they chose to have a baby too. So baby has to be budgeted. But be able to get up and go to dinner whenever they want. I can get up and go to dinner whenever I want. Or maybe take that trip, that long weekend trip. I can take that long weekend trip whenever I want. We don't have that luxury. I have that luxury. But were these decisions? Were these life choices? Was it, and again, I, I'm not criticizing that. What I am trying to do is get people to look at it from a different perspective. Before we sit and we play victim, okay, I just can't do these things. How is it that I can do it? And I'm a single one person school teacher. Perhaps it's because I made sure that the surroundings behind me didn't overtake me. That they didn't, that I didn't become house poor. They are in essence house poor. This is too much house. This is too much luxury for them. Rachel works at a nonprofit, Garrett as an insurance underwriter. All right, right there. Nonprofit. When I think of nonprofit, here's what immediately comes to my mind. You can afford to work for free. You are working basically at a charity that you're passionate about, that you really love. You know it doesn't pay a lot, even worse than teaching. You can afford to work there for free. And you can afford to work there for free either because you have your own money, maybe that came in already through inheritance, whatever. You are just financially independent or you have a spouse that makes a significant amount of money that allows you to basically do a hobby job. That's what I think of when I think of nonprofit. When somebody says, I work for nonprofit, my immediate assumption is you're in a relationship with someone who makes significantly more or you are independently wealthy, you don't really need a job, and you're now putting your time and passion into something that is nonprofit. It's a hobby job. He's in insurance. I think she said insurance underwriter. All right. Um, I spent three, four years, I think it was about four years, I was an insurance claims adjuster, auto adjuster, okay, um, for one small brief amount of time, I worked as administrative assistant in a workers comp type thing, but I was a hands-on claims adjuster, okay, for business, condo, auto, all of that stuff. They don't make that much. They're, they are in the same pay grade lineup as school teachers are. Same pay grade lineup. They're your 40, 50, 60, maybe if you're lucky, 70,000. A few might make 80 if they go into, you know, insurance, managerial, yada, yada. So basically, look, look, look at this surrounding here. Okay, let, let's just stop here for a minute. Take a look at this kitchen, right? See that farmhouse sink in the back? That's, that, that's an upgraded sink. You see those cabinets? Those are all upgraded. I can guarantee you those cabinets are probably on wheels also. They don't just, they, these aren't just pull out doors. I'm willing to bet that those cabinets glide, right? So they have one sink there. I think they also have an island. I don't know if they have an island. I think they have an island also. Look at the stainless steel uh, refrigerator. That looks like an upgrade. Look at the upgraded stove. All right. Um, we got a nice wine cabinet rack there. Okay. We seem to have a nice looking splash guard on the back. This is an expensive kitchen. This is where the money's going, folks. This is where the money's going. It's being nickel and dimed. No, I'm not just looking at the kitchen and saying the kitchen's what's to blame, but this is a snapshot. All right. People's surroundings are a snapshot. If you look at behind me, it's a snapshot of what the rest of my place looks like. It's pretty modest. Okay. Cute, cozy. Did a nice $15,000 remodel, ceiling to floor. It looks great. Okay. But you can still tell there's a certain level of modestness to it. If we look here, this kitchen is nicer than my parents who are retired with uh, uh, full uh, benefits and everything from 30 years each in the teaching career. This kitchen is nicer than theirs. Significantly nicer. I mean, I love your mom and dad. Okay. But She's a nonprofit employee. He's an insurance adjuster or insurance underwriter. It's all in the world of insurance. This is a lot of house and we're just looking at one corner of it. But their paychecks barely keep pace with their $3,400 monthly mortgage payment. Ready? Oh my God, I forgot about that part. $3,000. $400. People, I rest my case. I rest my case. 
They are way, I, I totally forgot. I told you, it's been, a, it's been months since I've seen this story. Wow, I forgot about that. $3,400. $3,400 in a mortgage. And they wonder why they're broke. And does there come a point where you just can't keep blaming that, well, we were told to go to college or whatever. Is there, does there come a point where you have to take personal accountability, personal responsibility and say, we kind of messed this one up. $3,400 just for the mortgage. Wow. Wow. Rachel's 26-year-old sister, Kristen, moved in to help offset costs for all of them. They should have never purchased this house. And I suspect what they got was, what is it that uh, when you walk in, you see, you go, oh, this is the dream house. This is what I want. If you look at the way, um, I, at least, at least if, I, if, if, I, if I look at the way my parents live, all these upgrades, uh, those of us that are in our, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, if we look at the way we were raised, okay, the houses that we lived in, all these upgrades for the most part didn't exist. They, these upgrades were considered, these would have been considered pretty much for the wealthy. And I think this is a lot of the problem that people are having, that younger people are having. Not so much people in my age bracket, because I was raised with panel, you know, wall panels. You know, those, what is those brown wall paneling and stuff, okay? Very reminiscent of the 70s, all right? But I wasn't raised in the upgrades that people see today in these houses. And you wonder why people are going broke, because nobody will build a basic house anymore. They won't build it. Because people want this, but then you can't afford it because it's $3,400. And then you have to have a relative come in and help you to move. But yet, on the surface, wouldn't people say they're doing better than I am? I live in 840 square feet. Well, who wants to live in 840 square feet? We want this house. Yeah, they wanted this house too. And look at the position they're in. And here's another thought. What would have happened if they had purchased my hundred? thousand dollar condo instead well we don't want that we don't want neighbors we, we we don't we don't want to be surrounded by that oh yeah i've heard that that's just an apartment is all it is yes but you see living here i can eat out whenever i want i can go on trips whenever i want i can afford to live on 50 percent of my income i can pay off a brand new car in six to eight months I don't need my relatives to come live with me to bounce the baby on the knee. I'm not saying that there isn't a certain stuck upness, but there is just some of that nose in the air of, you know, look at, our, look at the nice place we live in, even though we can't afford it. Look at where we live. It's, it's, it's the uh, keeping up with the Joneses. They cannot afford this place. And the minute I heard the 3,400 mortgage, yeah. This place was not well thought out. So all of this is affecting your family planning. You know, once we started getting daycare costs, it was like, we, we cannot afford to have another child. This kitchen is probably the freaking size of my condo. Just saying. This is just the kitchen and the recessed lighting looks beautiful. Although I do have a couple of recessed lightings in my condo, I will admit. So, you know, until he's in a public school system, I'd love for him to have like a partner in crime, but we can't afford to give him that for at least four years. But you could have chosen to afford to give it to him if you had chosen to downsize your lifestyle. This is about wants versus needs or needs versus wants. Okay, so the pity party of, well, we can't afford, we can't afford to give our child this. Yes, yes, you could have. Your child doesn't care whether or not you have a fancy kitchen to, rate, to, to you know, make his meals in. Your child doesn't care about the size of your house. Your child j just cares that you're there. So sometimes the pity party of, well, we just can't afford to give Junior this. Well, yeah, that's because you're paying $3,400 a month on your mortgage. And is that sad? I'm sad. But, but whose choice was it? 
you, you, you're, you're, you're surrounded by luxury. And yet she says that's lower middle class. Well, then what am I? I must be dirt poor. Like our, our family is dictated by our financials. And yeah, I just never thought it would be that, that way. Why would you not think it was, it wouldn't be that way? Is there something special about you that doesn't apply to anyone else? Our family it's our family. Our family is dictated by our financials. Unless you are super uber ultra rich and there are people who do, you know, that does exist. Guess what? You are dictated by your financials. People who make $200,000 a year are dictated by their financials. I know this. We've listened to plenty of their calls of, I make $200,000 a year and I'm broke. What? I would ask her, what, what puts her in a special position that she should not have to be dictated by her financials, but everybody else is. And again, if she's able to get to the point where she's not dictated by her financials, wonderful, more power to her. But I think most people are dictated by their financials. She works for a nonprofit. She ought to know. Buddy. So what would they do differently if they could do it all over again? Avoid student debt, even if that means rethinking college. Go to college, get out of poverty, make, you know, the money will come. It's not as that simple, right? Would I have been in a better economic position not taking in the, student, the graduate student loan debt? Yeah, probably. I think this idea of going to college is something that I don't know if Miles will do, and we have decided we're not going to push him there either. I think a lot of millennials were forced into saying like, you need a four year degree in order to be successful. And it's like, I have a communications degree and I definitely did not need that to be. What I've yet to hear is where they take responsibility and saying, we bought too much house. Maybe we had a child before we were quite ready. We bought too much house and we chose to have a child. It's kind of like raking in everything all at one time. It's that, it's that lack of patience, not blaming the baby. Don't come after me on that. Okay. You can come after me on anything else. I ain't blaming the baby. <laughs> uh, okay. But still, if you're going to be a family, some family planning, some family planning never hurts, honey. You know what? We want to have a baby and we're going to go ahead and also have a $3,400 a month house payment. That is an absurd house payment. Absurd. Well, yes, but that's the only thing that's affordable in their city. Then they needed to downsize a whole lot more, perhaps not get a house and just be a podunk person like me and live in an apartment, so to speak. I've not heard what, what I've heard is we, we, we fault the college degree. And, and I, and I, like I said, I will buy into part of that. I will accept part of that. Okay. But, um, you know, well, we blame it. The fact that it tells to go to college and we didn't get that. And then I didn't think, you know, and I'm really referring to this couple here, not so much the first guy. Okay. But, and then I didn't think I'd have to have a life dealing with the budget. I just thought, you know, I w would be able to live any way I wanted financially it was just all going to work. Lady, you work for a nonprofit your husband works for insurance. It's like you're married to the teacher and the teacher's aide. If you really want to put it in academic, I mean, excuse me, in educational terms, we have a teacher, that's him. We have the teacher's aide, that's her. And you're living with a mortgage at $3,400 and a new baby. Be successful. Um, and so I think like it starts with when you turn 18, you're already put into a disadvantage. And I think we need to like change that mindset for... I think she needs to change her mindset. The next generation. Did okay, I okay. And is she going to teach the next generation? Your dad and I bought too much house. We bought too much house before we before we were ready. I go to college to go do TikTok videos. No, but is that the one place right now where I can make, you know, money potentially? So let me go make my TikTok videos while I'm at it, and hopefully find a new way to live the American dream. Okay. I want to go back to the beginning of this video. That's actually the end. I know not everybody looks at the screen when they're listening. I want to go back to the beginning here. Okay. Um, here, here's, here's a full snapshot of the outside of their house. All right. This is appears to be a beautiful house. Nice, large, you know, uh, grass in the front appears to be sort of, you know, I, I like the little Christmas wreath. Like I said, this was filmed in January. So we got the reindeer out front. Okay. Um, let me go into here really quick. All right. Let's take a look at this guy's kitchen. All right. I want you to look at something. 
the countertop that she is leaning on. All right. This is, this is the guy who, um, this is the first guy that went to college and he's now a TikToker, a tutor, and then he does something else. I can't quite remember. Look at the counter that she's leaning on. If my eyes don't deceive me, I believe that is a marble countertop. First, I thought it was granite, but I think that's different than marble. I know what marble is, okay? I believe that is a marble cook countertop. If that is what I believe that is, that is expensive. If that is what I believe she is leaning on, I believe that is marble. I have a little baby marble cutting board, okay, um, for my cooking because I like to roll out pasta dough and stuff like that. It needs a cold surface. That is... If that is marble, that is expensive. Very, very expensive. Look at the fridge. Now, again, you may sit and you go, Carrie, why are you picking over these things? Because I want you to see what I see. That fridge, nice. Double door fridge, large com freezer compartment. My fridge is a basic $500 fridge from Lowe's. Yeah, you know, basic freezer on the top, refrigerator on the bottom. Absolutely nothing, nothing fancy. Okay. These are the sorts of things I'm not going to pick on every little thing. I think this house overall, I mean, we didn't see much of it, but overall, this house seems to be definitely more modest. You know, I can tell looking at the kitchen and stuff. But when we talk about people who talk, who say that they're being nickeled and dimed, I'm kind of skimming through the pictures here, folks. When we talk about people saying that they're being nickeled and dimed, okay, look at where it's going. Now, look at this scene of the house here. This is nice. My, my, my condo don't look like this. We got some nice recessed lighting in the back. Um, we got a really nice china cabinet or whatever. Again, I, I'm not, I'm not looking at any one thing. I'm looking at the whole thing. I, I hope, I hope that makes sense. But I kind of look at this and go, if the rest of the house reflects this, this is way nicer than what I live on. This is way nicer. I wasn't raised in these surroundings. I wasn't raised with these upgrades, I guess we might call it. Okay, these upgrades, marble countertops, recessed lighting, some nice crown molding. Okay, now I will admit for my place back here, I paid dearly to put on six inch baseboards and crown molding. It was a dream of mine. I wanted it. I got it. But this is for 840 square feet. Another reason I bought small is I knew I was going to upgrade this from ceiling to floor. And I factored that in. I factored that in going, you know, if I get 840 square feet, it's going to be a whole lot cheaper to do ceiling to floor remodel. All right. Then if I go and I buy a thousand square feet or 1200 square feet, I think a lot of these people purchased their house with the assumption that the college degree that they have will miraculously free them financially. And then they realize it does not. So Anyways, this is just my thoughts on this. Um, you know, I hope they teach it to their kids. Also, he said he was a first, I think this guy said he was an immigrant. All right. And he said he was first generation. This is not unusual with first generation to also get themselves financially over their head. Now, and, and of course, it doesn't just, just deal with immigrant families, clearly. Okay. But he's, I believe he said he was first generation college. So again, it's trying to have everything all at once. And I think when we hear people saying, you know, millennials, they think everything is as fast as Amazon delivery. They want the nice house. They want the car. They want the baby. They want the whole entire thing all at once. Yeah. And this is what winds up happening. This is exactly what winds up happening. The houses that they're living in, I got to be honest, folks. Okay. I, I did not see houses like this growing up and my parents weren't poor. My, like I said, these people are all in the same type of income bracket. You know, we, we just, we just working class folk. Okay. We just, we just working class folks. These people are all in the same Remember, The second couple, she, she, she's nonprofit. He's an insurance. Okay. None of my parents live with this luxury around them. None of them. Okay. My late mom and stepdad. All right. And my, uh, parents that are living now. Okay. My dad, my stepmom, none of them live in this luxury. It's something to think about. And young people may need to understand that they're not going to live nicer than their parents, just simply with the way the market is, the way the economy is. And I think the sooner that young people can accept that it doesn't mean you can't strive 
to reach for the stars and have your goals. But what it does mean is you, you understand that when you're making a move that is going to put you in financial jeopardy, financial harm, you accept that, Hey, you know what? I'm not here to compete against my parents. I'm here to do what works for me. I don't live nicer than my parents. Far from it. Far from it. But I can live on 50% of my income. My Just to give you some perspective, okay, with no car payment, like I said, it'll be paid off in about, I think it has about five payments left to go. Told you, okay, I'm booking it. I just got, I've only made two payments on, like I said, it'll be paid off in six to eight payments. My um, parents live yeah they they have a two acre farm okay um they're they're in eugene you know that they, they they have i think i believe it's it's about a two acre farm but their farm looks nothing like what we see here and i think part of it this is just my opinion i think social media promotes the you have to have more 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 we see more into people's lifestyles their homes, their budgets, this channel included, than we've ever seen. And so I think what happens is it can give some people a feeling of they, they're not successful. They haven't made it. I'll be really honest, family. There are days, there are days that I have where I look at this and I go, this is what you have at 56 years old. I don't live nicer than my parents. Absolutely not. Don't think I don't have those days where I go, gee, Carrie, you've made it really great. Ha ha, sarcasm. And then, you know, someone will remind me, but yeah, you live on 50% of your income, 50%. Um, I should have a hundred thousand saved in five years. All right. Goal is to have a couple hundred thousand saved over the next remaining 12 years that I have to work to go with the 30 year teacher pension to go with social security, yada, yada. You need to stop competing against your parents, young folks. We ain't going to win. I can't win. All right. You need to stop competing against your parents because her saying, well, this is lower middle class compared. I, I believe it was the second couple. Okay. The insurance adjuster and the nonprofit gal. Okay. The second couple that basically, you know, she's slamming herself and she's going, we're lower middle class, but then, then what am I? But yet at the same time, what am I? Because I don't need a sibling to live with me. I can eat out when I want. I can go on a vacation when I want, including overseas. If, if I said to myself, as soon as my car is paid off, if I said, you know what? I want to take myself on an overseas trip for Christmas. I could do it and have it done within about two paychecks. That's all it would take me. I, I, I don't need to do months and tons of savings. So what am I? Are we judging middle class by how much you own materialistically, even though you can't afford it? Or should we judge middle class not by what you own, but by your debt to income ratio? Just something to think about. Because if you really do think about it, it is kind of a puzzler. If she's lower middle class and broke, then what am I living in 840 square feet, but financially solid? And would she, would, this, would that couple, the second couple, have their nose in the air if somebody had said, hey, you know what? I live in a 840 square feet. My place is two bedrooms. This would be totally su suitable. As a matter of fact, the room that I'm in is the second bedroom. Wouldn't this make a beautiful baby's bedroom? Wouldn't it? And then the bedroom, the master bedroom, not much bigger than this. Okay. And they both overlook, look water, man-made water, but they both, I know I look out water over here. I look out water at, in the master bedroom. Okay. Um, and this was a hundred thousand dollars. I think they've been in this place a few years and I bought this place in 2020. Would they have turned their noses down at that? If someone said, hey, just buy a little hundred thousand dollar condo right now. Get yourself set up. Get yourself financially set up. You know, you can have that second baby that you want after you get yourself financially set up. It's a hundred thousand dollars. Baby can stay in this room. You know, mom, dad have the other room. They um, work to save up, you know, thousands of dollars. Maybe live like this for four or five years. Hell, two, three years. Okay, two, three years. And then go chase your dream house once your finances are all in order. Or would they have said, nah, because it makes us look broke. After all, we, we, we don't, we don't want to be seen in a place like this. The inability to be able to humble yourself 
the inability to be able to go, you know, we just might be living above our means. And yeah, this stuff is nice. The farmhouse sink is nice. The recessed lighting is nice. We got a big old marble island, whatever it is that the that their house has, because we only have a snapshot of it. So I can only imagine what the rest of it, rest of it might, must look like. Okay. The inability to say, mm, that's too much. Let's wait. That inability is expensive. Very, very expensive. And something tells me with her frame of mind, this is the second couple saying we're lower middle class and feel sorry for us because we can't do the things that we want to do. Well, maybe all she needs to do is ask a school teacher who lives in 840 square feet and can live on 50% of her income and say, how did you do it? And I would have said, because I live like this, try it for two, three years. What do you think her answer would have been? Thanks for joining me this evening. I hope you will join me again really soon here at the computer deck. I hope you will also consider subscribing. I'd appreciate the support. Good night, everyone.